as the supervising attorney for the clinical program since 1983 and as an adjunct professor of trial advocacy since 2003. Reverend Dr. John Mendez is a senior minister of Emanuel Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He is also the co-founder of the Daryl Hunt Defense Fund and is on the board of directors of the Daryl Hunt Project for Freedom and Justice. Benjamin Dowling Sender is a graduate of Harvard Law School and a former U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia. He was on the faculty of the North Carolina School of Government, Chapel Hill, for several years. He later became an assistant appellate defender for North Carolina and was appointed to represent Daryl Hunt on the appeal of the 1980 conviction. Dowling Sender worked on all appeals for the Hunt case in the state and federal courts and assisted with all of the state and federal post-conviction hearings for over 12 years. He continues to work as an assistant appellate defender, primarily representing defendants convicted of murder and sentenced to death. Katie Brown is an independent filmmaker who joined the Hunt team in the spring of 2004. Brown is a producer and director of Mother Trucker, a feature documentary profiling the life of Stacy McCaig, a 34-year-old mother, grandmother, and professional truck driver. Before learning to drive an 18-wheeler, I didn't know that. <laughs> Brown worked in production at Harpo Studios, we know what that means, uh, London Management Talent, and worked for the Ma London Management Talent Agency. She is a graduate of Northwestern University and is a tutor and junior committee member at the East Harlem School at Exodus House. She is originally from Philadelphia and lives in the West Village in Manhattan. Help me to welcome all of our panelists. <laughs> Daryl, I think the obvious question that most of us have is, why aren't you angry? Good evening. Um, well, there's a, a lot of reasons. One is about faith and forgiveness, and, and, but I need to tell you a story of what happened. <coughs> when I first went to prison, I was in prison two days, and I was walking around the yard, and an older man who had been locked up for t 25 years called me and told me to, uh, he had something he wanted to tell me. And I was like, okay. He said, well, if you want to live, you have to let anger and bitterness out of your heart because uh, anger and bitterness eats you up from the inside out. And he asked, Did you, do you want to live? And I was like, yes, because I want to prove my innocence. So from that day forward, I was determined not to be angry and bitter. Um, and then over the years, I came to understand that if I was to ask God to help me, to help free me, to help prove my innocence, and to forgive me for anything that I may have done to anyone, um, I must be willing to forgive others for what they have done to me or else I don't have the right to go to God and ask God to forgive me or to help me. So that's why I became. Reverend Mendez, I'd like to ask you about the unique and diverse religious coalition that came together to help exonerate Daryl. Yes. No, oh, you didn't hear me. I wanted to ask you about the unique religious coalition that formed. It was a diverse coalition that formed to help exonerate Daryl and the history of it. Initially, um, I, in fact, let me start here. I had just come to Winston-Salem. I was the new minister at the Emanuel Baptist Church. I was in my honeymoon and I was looking forward to having a good honeymoon. When this situation broke, um, I think the general sentiment 
of, of the city was somewhat that there was not enough evidence to convict Darrell, and I felt pretty uh, strong that um, he would be um, exonerated. And when I got the news that he had been found guilty, in fact, I was walking toward the um, courthouse, and I, I immediately became very angry and was looking for something, um, to, trying to figure out a way to get involved because I knew and felt deep in my heart that this was um, a, a, a real act of injustice. The um, second thing is that a number of us had been activists um, early on. Um, back in our college days, uh, we were involved in a lot of civil rights. So we knew each other uh, from uh, those experiences. Uh, Larry Little, uh, who called me um, and called a number of others uh, together and said, we have to do something about this. We were all in agreement with that. Um, we believed Larry. We believed um, what he had said because of our previous associations. Um, some of us were Christians. Some of us were Muslims. Um, some of us um, had other religions, but at the... Um, beginning, we never even thought about what our differences um, were or what they consisted. All that we knew was that we had to come together and pull this community together uh, to get uh, Darrell um, another trial. The Minister's Conference, of which I was associated in Winston, got involved and I raised the first $10,000 um, to uh, uh, get um, Daryl um, some um, attorneys that would help out with the um, uh, uh, Greek brief. And, um, and we continue to raise money to um, get him the kind of support uh, that he needed. Uh, so from the very beginning, we built a very broad coalition of, um, of persons of concern, uh, which included churches, uh, Muslims, um, uh, some Jews um, who were present at that particular time that got involved. But more importantly, the community itself came together and we began to have a number of rallies um, at my church um, to keep this alive, to raise money, and to uh, move the struggle forward. So in general, that was... Um, how we got going. Thank you. Benjamin Dowling Sender, what was the most frustrating legal disappointment of the case? I know there were many. <laughs> if you could point out to one for you. The most frustrating, pardon my croaky voice, <clears throat> I'm trying to get a, over a cold. The most frustrating uh, moment was hearing Judge Morgan say that the DNA testing in 94 didn't matter. Um, December 30th, 1994 was second, you know, when we heard from about the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court. But as hopeful as we were about that, we were even more hopeful that Judge Morgan was going to rule in Darrell's favor for the DNA um, because of the DNA exclusion. I remember leaving my office in Durham to go to the hearing, <clears throat> and our administrative sent, uh, assistant said, now, Ben, don't screw this one up this time. And I said, Anne-Marie, no way. Don't worry about it. You know, he's going free. Either at least he'll be on bond. And, uh, I mean, you could see from my reaction and uh, the not very very charitable words I said about the ruling that I was just felt completely devastated, destroyed. Mark Rabel, how evident was the threat of violence during that last moment before exoneration? Uh, I think that I would have thrown the first bomb. Um, 
Daryl had the luxury of not being angry because we were so pissed off. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very much the yin and yang. Somebody had to have the anger so that uh, we could sustain Daryl. Um, Daryl truly, I mean, I've spent, I don't know how many hours with Daryl at this point, but what you see is what we always saw, whether it was in private or in his public persona as you see now. Um, so his peacefulness really drove us, which made us all that much more angry. And I think when Larry said in the film at the end that if we didn't get Daryl out this time, Winston-Salem was going to blow, he was exactly right. And there, there was, it was time. It was time for Daryl to get out. And it wasn't the first time that we or people considered violence. I had forgotten until I went back and read my journals that uh, back in 1994, um, our Reverend Ministers John and <laughs> Reverend Eversley and others were um, ready to take over the district attorney's office when they found out that the district attorney was not going to agree to the re DNA results. In other words, the uh, district attorney believed in, we called it the flat earth theory, uh, <laughs> despite the Copernican revolution. Um, but the, it, it, it kind of made the ministers mad, and they were going to chain themselves to the, I don't know what they were going to do, but it was going to be bloody, and um, we talked them out of that, and then for some reason the morning Judge Morgan ruled against us as Anne Marie was telling Ben not to screw it up. I was, uh, I found that I wrote in my journals that uh, I was trying to decide what form of civil disobedience I was going to engage in at that point. I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be, but it, it was not going to be professional. And I think somehow Judge Morgan must have known that he had uh, done the wrong thing because he sort of tricked us. It, it, we didn't think the hearing was over. He just said, okay, uh, the, you can take Mr. Hunt out so he can talk to his lawyers. And I, we thought it was just to, to talk about whether to file an appeal or which of course <coughs> we were going to do. And uh, that really doubly ticked me off that I didn't get a chance to, um, I don't know what I was going to do, jump up on the table or start singing or something horrible. But uh, it, it was that point when our senior attorney, James Ferguson, who you saw in the film, said to me and Daryl that this is like the Wilmington 10 case, another North Carolina case, and we're at about the halfway point. So you just need to be patient. And um, that calmed me down. So there were several points when violence or civil disobedience were averted, and we never engaged in civil disobedience or violence, and probably were the better for it, although I don't know exactly what stopped us. Katie Brown, tell us what's next for this film. The film, uh, the film premiered at Sundance this past year. And right just prior to that, it was picked up by HBO. So it will um, air on HBO in the spring, in April. And then it will have a limited theatrical release following that. So by next summer, and then it will be available on DVD. So um, we're doing a lot of, we've been doing film festivals all year and traveling as a, a mini rock group, <laughs> traveling to all these festivals and um, we're now starting to do a lot of law school screenings and a lot of outreach work and um, educational work with the film. So in high schools, community groups. Um, so that's starting now and will continue through till um, after the broadcast. Now I'd like to open up the conversation to you guys. If you could go to one of the microphones and state your name and your affiliation, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Hello. Um, I'm a third year law student here at Harvard, and uh, me and my friends just stumbled in on this movie. We're, we're doing a, a clinical for um, defense attorney wannabes, 
And um, I didn't know that I had enough time to sit here, but this has been a life-changing event for me. And uh, I thank you for putting the movie together, for living this life. And I don't really have a question, it's more a statement that um, I think more people need to be aware of what goes on in the criminal justice system and how it affects people and, and steals years and lives of our talented black males and now females. And um, this just did it for me and, and decided my career path, so I thank you. Yes, I, uh, I'm Reverend Stevie Kraft. I'm a Master Divinity alumni from Harvard Divinity School, class of 96. And uh, I'm working on a doctor ministry program in criminal justice issues. I've worked as a prison chaplain, Missouri State Penitentiary, and had to work with death row cases. I still do a lot of work in the penitentiary. Uh, I'll be doing some prison evangelism down in Angola on death row in November. And I wanna know, panel, what can I do as an alumni of the Divinity School working directly in the criminal justice system, dealing directly with criminal justice issues. How can I help, especially in the area I heard you say, Ms. Brown, dealing with educational, working with youth, because I do a lot of high school assemblies as a motivational speaker. And my emphasis right now is trying to help young people, irregardless of their ethnicity, uh, avoid the trap of getting caught up, caught up in the criminal justice system uh, my emphasis is on prevention now because it's easy to, to get caught up in this madness, but like we saw with Brother Darrell, it's hell getting out. So I'd like to know what can I do as I complete my doctoral program in criminal justice issues, how can I get more involved? I live in New Jersey now uh, to work with you all. Thank you. That's for you. Darrell, do you want to explain what you're doing actually with your foundation right now? Just as a start. Um, one of the things that we do, well, we do a couple of things. Uh, one is innocence. You know, we work with other innocence parties, as April was saying earlier. Um, but we do reentry to help those coming out of prison to actually get a, a real opportunity to, to enter society again. Um, <clears throat> because the problem is one, once they get trapped into the system, they're in the system for life. Uh, because when they come out, they can't get a job because they have a felony. They can't get housing because they have a felony. They can't get food stamps because they have a felony. Um, they have to pay the probation and parole officers for being supervised, for being on probation or parole. Uh, and they can't do that without a job. So you're forcing them to go right back into criminal activity in order to survive just to stay out of prison. And in essence, they wind up going back to prison. Um, so what we try to do is help them find these needs and help them with counseling. Because most people that wind up in the criminal justice system have a problem. And it's not... Uh, they have, they are bipolar, they have addictions. Uh, those problems are never addressed. They go to prison and they come out. They go in as human beings and they come out criminal minded because of the system. The system is not there to rehabilitate, the system is there to warehouse. And then they come back out and then we wonder why people go back to prison because they're not given the opportunity to be human beings. When you go in prison, you become a number. You, you're not a human being, you become a number. I remember my number, 2026534. I remember that number for the rest of my life because that's who I was for almost 20 years. Uh, and then they kick you out after they don't made you dependent upon their system and tell you to be independent. How can you be independent when You've been dependent upon a system of somebody telling you what to do, how to do it, where to walk, what to wear, and what to say. 
and then you come back to society and they say, well, okay, now you can live, but you are carrying that mark on you, that life sentence of that felony for the rest of your life. And so what we try to do is help people make that adjustment. And that's the hardest part of what we do uh, because I see it every day. I lived in there and I wondered why people some brothers was coming back to prison. I would ask them, you know, what is it? You like prison? And they would tell me, no, I just ain't, I can't get a job. I, I got to do this. And I was like, no, you don't. And when I got out and everybody in Winston-Salem knew that I had been in prison for 19 years for something I didn't do. And the governor had pardoned me and I had been exonerated. And I went to apply for a job and they told me I was missing 19 years on my resume. So I understood what it means, what people who wasn't as fortunate as me go through every day. And I started looking into it and I, and I really understand the hurdles that they have to go through to survive. So. I think the other thing, and, and Daryl has done a phenomenal job in terms of, you know, uh, finding jobs for those who are on the reentry uh, level. But you got to put this also in a larger context. We're talking about the community of the oppressed. You can't separate oppression from the prison system. You know, there's some real class differences as well as racial differences in terms of who goes to prison, how long they stay there, and under what conditions they remain um, in prison. So there's a relationship between the community of the oppressed, the conditions that they live under, as well as the uh, kinds of, um, certain kinds of pathologies that uh, develop. In other words, what I'm saying is oppression makes you sick. You can't marginalize a group of people and then expect them to come back um, healthy. One of the other dimensions that we're trying to introduce in terms of addressing and dealing with that situation is that before they go to prison, there's got to be certain interventions to deal with many of the issues that young uh, people face today. If you listen to hip hop, to rap, etc., it's nothing more than the urban blues that expresses the pain that young people are experiencing um, in their communities, at home, in school, et cetera. And once um, they have been neglected enough, ignored enough, um, they fall back on their grandiose selves and with all of the rage that has built up over a period of time, um, it's like a crime that's waiting to happen simply because there are no interventions and they believe that nobody cares. Um, we see that at the elementary level, um, when you see how angry young people can become, and no child ought to be that angry at that age, eight, nine, 10. We see it at the middle uh, school level, and we see it certainly um, by the time they get to be teenagers. Um, so one of the things that we're hoping to build communities that provide the kind of um, interventions as well as therapies that's ne needed to help them to become focused and in situations, as Darrell mentioned, a lot of young people suffer from certain kinds of bipolar uh, illnesses and as well as other illnesses that never get treated. In my own work, um, I have seen this and I know how frustrating it is to try to get the kind of help and support and the facilities that's necessary. And I'm not just talking about you know, locking them up, throwing away the key, but a facility that provides the therapeutic environment that's necessary as well as tie them into the community and tie them into education. You know, so it's about a three or four um, component uh, that's necessary, I think, to really create the kind of interventions that's, that's, now here's the real trick bag, that when you look at what upper middle class and particularly white kids experience 
when they developed certain pathologies, they got all kinds of wilderness camps with therapeutic communities built into those camps. The problem is it costs at least eight to $13,000. And I discovered that in trying to find a place to house some of these kids and get them the help that they need. Um, we could not afford it. I don't know anybody in these communities that could afford it. And they had absolutely nothing. So we sort of on the campaign now trying to um, see if we can develop these facilities and these interventions so that poor children can get the same kind of help that upper middle class and rich kids get. Good evening, my name is uh, Melinda Weeks. I am an attorney and um, an HDS uh, graduate as well. First of all, thank you all so very much, Daryl, for your perseverance um, and your elegant spirit and all of you for your contributions and staying the course. We thank you for this model of um, activism um, and justice seekers. My question is, is this, um, I have two, two two aspects of it. One, with respect to the coalition, the ways in which um, you all worked together um, from the legal perspective and kind of partnering with the religious community, and then the role in terms of the activism. We saw rallies, we saw huge amounts of people, um, <coughs> and then even further with the addition of the media uh, from the reporter that seemed to be a turning point um, to some extent in the case. Could you just give us more of a window into how that practically worked? Because it seemed like, in some sense, the team had many parts to it. Um, and in terms of those of us who are activists and, and doing some of the same things, the models for success are far and few between. We know so much injustice is, is all over the place, but it is few instances where it kind of works for the good. So very interested in more of a window into how, func how you all function together to form this partnership and then particular the role of the media which today since we're inundated with so much information we have the internet which is more of an issue now so much information to get one thing to stand out to, to tip the balance for the community to, to rise up and support um, is I think maybe even more difficult than it may have been 10 years ago so thank you again, and if you could just respond to some of those things to teach us more, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I think some of that falls on me. Um, one of the interesting things is I think back and reflect on a lot of this. Number one, as I mentioned, that we all knew each other. Um, so that there was not a lot of ego tripping or ego involved. The second thing is we respected each other and we respected the different roles that all of us played. Um, when Larry uh, Little you know, came to us, you know, as I said, we believed him. And we said, Larry, you take the lead on this. Um, Dr. Eversley, who uh, was very you know, um, uh, vocal in the um, film, uh, actually headed up the public relations aspect of the work. Um, when Larry went to law school, I took over as the uh, chairperson of the committee. And also my role um, in many of the rallies were, uh, was, was aimed at stirring the people up, motivating them, and sort of acting as a kind of gadfly. Um, uh, Khalid, who was a Muslim, um, was very involved in terms of um, um, bringing in that aspect of the community. And even though he wasn't as vocal, but he was vocal, but it just seems as, um, that the, as far as the religious community, we didn't have a lot of ego tripping going around. We respected each other's roles and we all did different things at different times as the occasion uh, necessitated. Um, in terms of working with the lawyers, we knew we were not lawyers. And we had to, um, uh, take, um, in many instances, um, our cue from them and give them the, uh, the support. There were times, um, I remember in uh, Hickory, I think it was, when I begged 
uh, Fergie to let me disrupt this court. It was an all-white jury. I, you know, we had Goma Powell's and Fife and all those folk on the jury. There was no way in the world we believed that we could get a fair um, trial, especially in that town. You know, and it, uh, we felt that Dara was not um, really being judged by his peers as such. Um, it, and, and, and the proof was in the pudding. Um, uh, we remember Ferguson putting on a brilliant case. Um, Mark, you know, was brilliant. And t but they didn't hear that. They came out in almost an hour, whatever it was, laughing, you know, having fun, the judge and the jury, you know, laughing with each other. And I mean, I was devastated and um, really wanted to do something. But, you know, Fergie and everybody calmed me down and, you know, we got to move forward. And I mean, all of that. So the respect that we had for each other and I think the primary thing that draw, drew all of us close together was Daryl. You know, that was all we were concerned about. We knew we had to eventually try to uh, get Daryl exonerated. That was a long struggle. And, um, and that was the thing that kept us focused. So, you know, we weren't all over the place. We had a common denominator, which was Daryl. Um, we had the respect for each other. Most of us were activists, you know, anyway, and we all had different roles to play. And we all rallied that community around us, and, and, um, and it worked well. I don't think we ever had one argument, one fight in those 19 years. We had some disagreements, we debated them, um, and then we, you know, concluded on a higher note of unity, you know. And that was basically how it worked. And we brought most of the larger religious community together and we didn't leave anybody out. Anybody that wanted to help participate, we included them. I have a question for Daryl. Um, I'm not quite sure how to put it, but did you feel or to what measure and, and how did you feel the support that was outside going on for you, how did, or did that get to you? I mean, in the film you mentioned at times that you felt that support from within prison. How did that get to you? Because I know you didn't, couldn't see what was going on. And the other part of it is, was there anything while you were there in prison that actually was helpful to you? Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of things and, you know, one of, besides the fact of my faith in God and God's presence and understanding that God works through people and the people that he sent to help me, um, you know, the people that you see right here um, helped me grow in more ways than anyone would ever realize. Um, my educational level <coughs> expanded because, not because of the system, but because of the people that was there who was feeding me books. Um, I was in jail for nine months in a single cell, and before I left that cell, you could not see me in the cell because of all the books that they had, <laughs> that I had stuck in the bars from reading that they had brought me. Um, that elevated me to a, a whole different level. But the, the other key thing for me about the support level was that whenever they came to see me, even though I knew in my heart that it, was, it wasn't going the way that it should go, and they would never give me that impression. They would make me feel happy they're gonna make me laugh and if you get to know mark and you, know, you will see they would give me that sense of hope uh, that they wasn't giving up uh, a lot of things that you've seen in the film i didn't even know until i watched it uh, what was going on outside 
because when they came to see me, they didn't give me that side. They gave me the side to continue to fight the hope and don't give up no matter what was going on. Um, the people inside of prison, um, you would hear certain things about the community, but that the whole background of the people marching down the street, and I didn't get to see that. Um, but knowing it, feeling it, I could feel in my heart things was going on. And when I, when they come and see me, you know, it was genuine. It wasn't. They wasn't faking support or love. It was genuine. And that sustained me and kept me going. Hi, I'm a third year student here at Harvard Law School. And thank you so much. I've been very inspired by everything. Um, at the end of the movie, I noticed that you were compensated by the state, <clears throat> like a little over 380000 for being in jail 20 years, and that just seemed like an injustice again. So I wanted to know if you were pursuing a civil, any civil action at all. Uh, I think I can answer that here. <laughs> uh, we are. Um, and it's not so much as the money because no amount of money could give me back those years. The problem is the system hasn't changed. And the only way that you can really affect change within this system is it has to be financial. If they don't feel a financial pinch, then they're not going to change. They're going to continue to do the things that they're doing. And even today, you know, since I've been released, there have been new laws that has been corrected. Um, they got open file discovery. Um, and they recognized that laws, uh, the laws that had me in prison was wrong. But there's two things, two side notes to that. One is that they have 180 some people on death row who was affected by those same laws that the law is not retroactive. So you can't say that it's fair. Uh, two, they're learning new ways to get around even the laws that they have changed. So. The mentality of the system has not changed until the mentality of the system changes, you know, we're still going to be dealing with the same effects. Hi, I'm a first year law student here and sort of follows up on uh, this question, but my primary response besides being overjoyed that it turned out eventually the way it did was one of anger and bitterness. And I was just wondering if any of you could speak to um, responses that you got from individuals or community members that you were really happy about and maybe didn't expect and then others that you wished you had received that you know might have made some sort of symbolic gesture um, just about the whole process um, but that you didn't one of the things I did not mention uh, earlier that should be said as a community and I think um, this help draws closer together as well. Um, when you take up this kind of work, you will become persecuted. And um, uh, the community, particularly the white community, said many scathing things and called us all kinds of names from go back to Africa. I, my children, you know, were persecuted. Um, my wife was persecuted. Um, you know, my church was persecuted. I mean, we went through, you know, even people within my own congregation, you know, thought I was wrong. Um, and the rest of us were wrong. So there's a, a, a certain amount of persecution you have to be prepared to take. It's not a pretty road, um, you know, uh, to take. And, um, and, and, and we lived through that. The other thing was that uh, last trial almost took me out of ministry. I was ready to quit, give it up. In fact, I had prepared to. I was so uh, despaired after that. The only thing that saved me, I went back and started reading the Greek tragedies and existentialism. 
And that sort of got me focused again. I was over optimistic and did not have a real perspective in terms of what the nature of this world is and that the tragic is real. And it was out of the tragic that um, I formed a new optimism and I call it tragic optimism. <laughs> um, and when we got the victory, it was not just a victory, it was tragic victory. And so um, trying to keep those you know, two um, forces in tension and, and, and sort of live our lives through, you know, in the midst of that. But that, you know, is real. And the reason I mention that because it's so easy to look for quick results when you get involved in these kinds of struggles and when it doesn't come quick as you think it should, then it's easy to give up and, and, and just, you know, cut it loose. But that was, you know, something that I, I was not the only one who was affected, you know, that way. I think we all went through all kinds of, of, of changes. And, um, but, in, uh, but on the other hand, um, after Phoebe, you know, had written that article, that major article, um, even my neighbors who would not speak to me, you know, all of a sudden saw this whole situation in another light and said, wow, you know, it sounds like he really got a bad deal. So I think the community began to wake up, you know, at that point and, um, and all of a sudden, you know, this, the momentum was back and the movement took a, a, a turn for the better. And that's when all these other things, you know, more or less began to happen. Let me just add something to that and to the law, to the law students. I, you know, it's easy to get angry and bitter. <clears throat> That's certainly a constant battle. But as long as we have, um, as long as we have a system of government, and as long as we have human nature, that's going to be the eternal battle. Because, you know, we haven't really changed that much since Beowulf was written. There's, there's always going to be a Grendel. There's always going to be a dragon. There's always going to be a Saddam Hussein. There's always going to be people at Guantanamo, no matter where they put it. And the role of the true criminal defense lawyer is to protect the rights of a few individuals. And if you have the honor to do what I did, which is represent a Daryl Hunt for most of my life, then you can feel good. But you know, I think uh, the beauty of, of the film is that the story is told, and it's told well. It's told beautifully in all its tragedy and in all its wonder. And throughout it all, I think what you come up with is faith. But what I really like about it is that it, it does show the loneliness of, of our road, yet the, the beauty of it as well. It's almost like, um, it's, it's sort of weird, but the day before the first trial, To Kill a Mockingbird was on television. And that's how I prepared the last day. And since then, I've reread To Kill a Mockingbird <coughs> several times. And um, in, in a lot of ways, I do see some of the things that Atticus Finch had to say to his children. And so when you're out there doing whatever it is you have to do, if you're a criminal defense lawyer, if you can explain it to your children in an honest way, then you're doing the right thing. It may mean that your children get spit on. It may mean that they get attacked uh, on the way back from the Halloween party. And it may mean that, as, as John has said, that your children may be criticized, your family may be criticized, as, as ours were. But, you know, that's... That's the road we've chosen, and that is the, the path that, that we have to follow. But uh, to the divinity people that are here, um, it, you can't separate these things. We're all, we're all in, in the same boat together. And I know that generally speaking, lawyers are not supposed to talk about religion. We're not supposed to talk about faith. <clears throat> we're supposed to talk about the abstract law. But let me tell you, if John and... Ben and Larry and Carlton and, and the rest of us 
hadn't had a number of religious discussions along the way, and not just discussions, but if we hadn't supported each other with a faithful support, we, we would never have been successful. So, yeah, there's anger and bitterness along the way, but, you know, it's like having a flat tire. You, you change it and go on. I have a um, <clears throat> follow-up, and again, <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. I think one of the things, when I look back on all these years, is that one of the things that has really um, been imprinted on my mind and heart is, and really it gets at what John was saying, is that at the core of this system should be a recognition of human fallibility. And I think this is something that um, the law school folks and the divinity school folks can um, both understand and agree on. Um, maybe it's hard sometimes to appreciate it. You know, at Harvard, everything's, you know, everyone's supposed to be perfect, right? And know everything. But we don't. We don't. And we didn't while we were going through it. We were stumped time and time again. We were eminently fallible lawyers. Um, we were smart. We were resourceful. We had Daryl motivating us. Uh, we worked as an incredible team, and we still kept losing. You know, so why did we keep losing? Um, we kept losing because we were up against a system that refused to acknowledge human fallibility. <clears throat> At its worst, it was a system that was corrupt and knew that it was fallible, but was just going to make sure that um, you know, this conviction stuck because that's what was going to happen, no matter what. You know, they got a guy. It's kind of like what the police chief said at the beginning. <clears throat> My job was to get, a ch to get someone charged. I got someone charged. You know, the DA's job was to get someone convicted. He got someone convicted. You know, so it was the wrong black guy. We got somebody. I mean, truly, there was that going on. I also think there are people who genuinely believed that they were trying to do the right thing. I think two of the prosecutors might well have felt that, possibly Dean Bowman, in fact you heard him, say, I got convinced that I was right and I was going to make it happen. That's what he said about the second trial. Eric Saunders, who did the hearing afterward, he was convinced he was right. He said in, that, in the movie, you know, why did he argue against the DNA, other than it was his job? Why did he argue against the DNA? Because it didn't make sense. Now, think about that. What didn't make sense? The DNA has to make sense. It's there. It's a fact. What didn't make sense was their response to it. So it's, you know, the law, you know, why do we have an adversarial system? Because of human fallibility. It's because witnesses perceive things wrong, because witnesses have poor memory because witnesses lie. And what goes for witnesses goes for everyone else in the system. And the more we recognize that human, see, if, you, if the system, if the people like Judge Morgan or the state Supreme Court had just spent a few minutes of honest reflection to understand how wrong that they could have been, this could have been changed at any point along the way. But they refused to, and the more it went on, the worse it got. I'll, I'll finish with one example that will stun you. Uh, it's not, they couldn't say everything in the film. Um, when we went into federal court after we lost in the state Supreme Court, um, we went before a U.S. magistrate, and he issued an opinion, of course, against us. And remember what Judge Morgan said. Well, maybe... Daryl didn't do the rape after all, but he was involved. Um, this magistrate came up with another theory. It's like he's in poker, you know, I see you and raise you one. He said, well, maybe what happened, and I kid you not, you could read his opinion. Maybe what happened is that Daryl robbed and killed Deborah Sykes and that a homeless, you know, bum um, came along and raped her 
after she was dead. Now, this is a person who responds to DNA testing that had exploded the state's case, you know, by coming up with a story that is crazier than any defense lawyer story I've ever heard of. Um, and it continued in the Fourth Circuit. <clears throat> Mark argued, and I was sitting next to him, dumbfounded, listening to the court saying, we were belaboring this whole DNA stuff. I mean, that wasn't so important. So it's a system that from bottom to top refused again and again and again. It had so many opportunities to look reality in the face and recognize it. Um, and really, it was persistence, it was grace, it was Phoebe Zerwick's theories at the end. Um, and I, I guess I'll just have to fall back with grace. I mean, somehow, God worked through us to force the system to recognize its fallibility. And that was why the case finally happened, ended up as it did. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm a graduate student in anthropology here at Harvard. And um, I wanted, I, my question was about the DNA evidence, which you addressed somewhat. And it seems it's a very powerful technology, but it seems like in this case it was very complexly dealt with. And um, I guess my question was, um, do you think that DNA evidence in the criminal justice system has the possibility of being a powerful counterforce against the structural racism that we see? Does it offer that kind of promise? Well, there, I'll take this one. The DNA, DNA is one of the greatest things to come along in the history of the criminal justice system. The, the science of DNA is irrefutable. I mean, no, Nobel Prizes have been won concerning the science of DNA. The problem with it is we come back to human fallibility because of the testing procedures, the collection procedures, the possibility of contamination. And we also have the problem that there are many laboratories that are run by law enforcement. And you know, how can you possibly be objective if you are a sworn law enforcement officer? And we know that with DNA technology, there's a, any number of problems that can happen along the, along the way with contamination. There's also problems of interpretation. For example, even with the most sophisticated STR technology, there can be interpretations as to how the, how the graphs are set up and whether somebody calls a match on this peak or, or not a certain peak here and there. There's all sorts of problems. So it comes back to recognizing that we need the proper training. The fear I have, uh, and, and for, let me just add, well, there's so many things I could say about DNA. It, it is great, but uh, it has exposed the fallibility of all the other so-called forensic sciences. For example, there was a guy given the death penalty, I think it was in Arizona or New Mexico somewhere, and the best evidence against him was a bite mark. And the guy had, did have a funny larger front tooth and, and you could see that in the bite mark in the photograph. And so the uh, forensic dentist uh, gave an opinion that there was a positive match. Well, as it turns out, uh, the police were aware of another person and later on they did some DNA testing and, and they tested a swab taken from that very bite mark and had DNA, which actually showed that it was not the guy who was convicted and had been given the death penalty, it was this other guy who also had a funny looking front tooth. So DNA has saved us from that. There's all sorts of horror stories about uh, other types of forensic opinions that have been given over the years. But you know, the scientists, the scientific community is the best example of, of the recognition of human fallibility with uh, you know, every, everything from recognition of the observer effect to all sorts of uh, problems that uh, are inherent in human memory and eyewitness identification. Uh, racism, will DNA technology help us counter racism? Well, it will help expose examples of racism as we have in this case, but there are only very few cases in which there are, there are biological samples that can be tested with DNA. Uh, one great example from the FBI's own records and from State Bureau own records are that in a number of rape cases, they come up with a chief suspect based on eyewitness identification or based upon statements of people. When they send those to the F FBI, 
of the first or primary suspects are cleared and never charged, 25%. So, you know, that's one, that's one of the great things about DNA technology if it is, if it is available. But don't, uh, what state are we in? Um, Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> is this the state that in which, is, is Romney the governor here? Yeah. Is this the state that had the commission set up to come up with a, a foolproof death penalty system mm -hmm. with the scientists who uh, were looking into it? I think it was because I heard some of these guys speaking on a panel at a, earlier this year. And the governor, I mean, it, it was good of him to try to consider the value of forensic science and DNA technology, but uh, the guys, I think, that were on his commission were sort of at a loss to help come up with the perfect death penalty system because there are so many things that are inherent in, uh, with human fallibility, as, as we've talked on and on about. Um, I don't know if that answers your questions or not. I guess the answer is no. <laughs> Yeah, my name is uh, Philippe Copeland. I'm a HDS graduate, uh, class of 99. And I, I have a reflection for uh, Brother Hunt uh, that's going to lead into a question. I, I was really um, touched by the images of um, yourself and your wife in prayer um, as Muslims. And I really thought of the contrast between that image and this film. And I thank you for that and the image that we see every night of Muslim people around the world every night. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say thank you for the filmmaker and also thank you for yourself and your wife for being gracious to allow your devotional experience to be shared with other people so that they can see a positive image of Muslim people. Um, and uh, related to that, I'm just wondering if, if you could just, and you're so humble, so I'm afraid you're going to say no, <laughs> but I'm just wondering if you could please uh, just offer a, just a small statement about your faith and the importance of your faith in getting you through your experience. Thank you. Um, my faith was uh, a big part, uh, the biggest part of me getting through. And, and I'll always have to give credit to my grandparents because it was my grandparents who used to force me to go to church every Sunday. And even though I didn't want to go to church, because um, I didn't think I was getting anything out of it, it was that that led me to my faith and to my uh, determination and to my moral conviction not to do something that I did not do. I, I, I wasn't going to admit to something that I didn't do. And to have that faith and determination to, to live and have peace of heart um, instead of freedom. Uh, I wanted freedom, physical freedom, but I was more free in my heart because I knew I hadn't committed this crime and I wasn't going to plead guilty to something that I, I didn't do and it was all because of my faith in God. Um, we call him Allah. You call him Jesus. It, to me, you know, it's the supreme being who controls everything. I don't care what you call him, uh, but he controls everything and every day that I sit in prison, my faith grew stronger because it was always something that he would let me know that he was there. And like I said about forgiveness, it took me a while to learn the true meaning of forgiveness. Uh, we talk about it a lot, but we don't actually practice it. We expect it from others, but we don't want to give it. And until we start giving it, regardless of who we are, uh, or what we call ourselves, until we actually start giving that thing that we expect from others, then we would never be able to, to be happy or to have peace um, and to 
love and respect one another. Uh, and I think that's what I learned. And my faith helped me understand that. And it helped me. And I think you can see the blessings of faith and what true faith really means in, in the context. For me, when I stood in Reverend Mendez's church, December 2003 and looked around me and seen all the denominations